Okay, Shobha, we have already been introduced, so let's get the show going. Mm -hmm. Now, you are going to have another conversation with Sanjay Roy. And uh, I asked Sanjay, I said, how do we divide Shobha up? Because <laughs> I'm I in love conversation that. with her and you are in conversation with her. So how Sanjoy do we multiply said, her would be more interesting, yeah. but however. <laughs> so Sanjay said, I'm going to talk to her about her books and you talk to her about the rest. <laughs> so that's the way it has been decided by the head honcho of JLF and that's the way it shall be. But I'm very happy because actually rest is best. Uh, after all, you are so much more than your books. I mean, your Twitter bio describes you as journalist, columnist, social commentator and opinion shaper, besides, of course, being the author of 21 books. Uh, no wonder you have 2.6 million followers on Twitter. There are over 100 PhDs and dissertations written on your work, and your books are taught in universities across the world. You have written for TV serials like Kitty Party and Swabhiman. You started uh, and edited three trailblazing magazines, Stardust, Society, and Celebrity. You had your own fashion label, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But the first question I want to ask you is, what is the label you are most comfortable with? Ghati girl. Ghati girl, because I'm Maharashtrian, very proud of it. Uh, I'm from the Ghats. Uh, Maharashtrians are from the Ghats. My most precious identity is that of a working class Maharashtrian woman. Well, I don't know about that, but I certainly remember as an adolescent flipping through Stardust and heading straight for Nita's Natter and lapping up all the gupshup on Tinseltown, what is Zini Baby doing and what is Garam Dharam doing and what is, of course, the man who shall not be named Lambu or the angry young man <laughs> doing, etc. So tell me, how did you get into film journalism? I mean, was there a voyeuristic streak in you from the beginning? While I admit to being a voyeur, because every writer has to be a, a voyeur, if you're not curious about life around you, you cannot have a sense of curiosity or a deep sense of observation. So yes, I confess absolutely without any hesitation uh, being a voyeur. The film industry did not interest me then. It does not interest me now. It was a job I was given to do. Uh, and quite by accident, I was... Uh, uh, offered the editorship of Stardust by a very canny and a very smart um, businessman, uh, Nari Hira. And uh, obviously he had seen something about my writing because uh, till then he was really flogging me as a writer doing uh, ghost writing columns for I think it was Simi Garewal uh, uh, because he also ran a cosmetics company for cold wax so ladies can look nicely <laughs> Um, all spruced up with his cold wax, a lure cold wax, I think it was called. So I used to do a lot of ghostwriting for him. And I joined his uh, advertising agency as a copywriter intern, uh, where he'd offered me a princely sum of 350 rupees as my monthly stipend, and got at least 30,000 or 3 lakhs worth out of me after that. But that's a good businessman, right? And when he was launching Stardust, he thought uh, it might be a good idea to give me a shot at it. The film industry at that point, and it continues to be sort of razzle-dazzle. It's a parallel universe, a parallel world. Bollywood is uh, really planet Bollywood. in its own. It has its own rhythm, its own logic. And I love the madness of films. And I, I'm, I like cinema a great deal. But the jumping jack, Jitendra, uh, Garam Dharam, uh, all of this. Uh, you Shotgun know, Sinha. Shotgun Sinha. Those names just came about because I like language. I like playing with language. And uh, I was not given a brief to stick to the Queen's English, thank God. And we weren't living in Jane Austen's times. So I could break all the rules, and Nari Hira encouraged it. So Nita's Natta, I used to rewrite because I didn't meet the film people okay. at all, unless they came. Uh, to our uh, ratty, smelly little office, very shabby, <laughs> over a water tank. Uh, it was really a dreadful place. But they did come there because Stardust by then had established itself as such a huge brand. 
Initially, they ignored us because they couldn't stand how irreverent we were. But when we became number one, they used to come to the office, and that's where I met them. And I was happy to do that because it, I thought it was very important for me to keep that distance from the movie business, which um, I, I maintained throughout my career as a Stardust editor for 12 years, uh, establishing the brand. And then it was kind of boring. Then we moved to society. But the film industry by itself is riveting. There's no question about it. And like uh, Scott Fitzgerald used to say, the rich are different. Well, movie stars are different too. I mean, they really have lives which are uh, can be so bizarre or can be so human and can be so vulnerable. Depends how you see it. I remember the first edition of Stardust. I think it was October 1971. And there was a bold splash on the cover saying, is Rajesh Khanna secretly married? That was the, I think, the launch of Stardust. But tell me, now in the age of internet, is the gossip column dead and have the stars lost their mystique? The gossip column is actually at everybody's fingertips. Everybody is gossiping. Everybody is gossiping today. You don't need a magazine to gossip. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, a, it's a very democratic space where we're all opinion shapers. We're all saying whatever it is we want to say about whoever we wish to say it about. And it gives a certain anonymity to people who prefer to hide behind uh, uh, handles, which I've never done, so I'm, I'm quite OK. But gossip, per se, the zing is missing. I mean, at the end of it all, a column has to have a certain style yes. for the, a column to endure. You've got to play with language, but you've got to know language to start with. So when I started playing with Hindi words, and now I'm called the grandmother of English, English, yes. English which I proudly own, uh, the idea was to demonstrate that uh, street speak and colloquialisms have a space in, in India and that we don't have to be conformists. And the whole idea is, in fact, to use language differently. But at that time, the kind of criticism that came my way uh, had to do with, oh, poor girl, she's writing this bichari. She probably doesn't know uh, a good grammar. She doesn't know English. And she's resorting to these kind of uh, very strange the usage, which then became mainstream. And that, um, I today, when I look back at how English became mainstream and newspaper headlines became English uh, driven. Exactly. It's uh, it's fascinating to see where English has come, and there's so many uh, doctorates done on how it has evolved. So I find that fascinating because just two weeks ago I was talking about English to a professor at SOAS in London, who's done a study on it, uh, and she's Italian, Francesca. And uh, she's a professor of hin Hindi. She could call herself professor of English. And of course, she's a professor of Gujarati. Yeah. But you know, to the academics have started to recognize it as a legitimate way of communication. But we still have our hang-ups and prejudices. And uh, for example, if I go into my bank, and if I speak to the bank guys in Marathi, or Minglish, which is Marathi and English, they immediately switch to English as if to say, so, uh, you know, we know to English, we know to uh, eat English, we know to sing English, we know to talk English, which is the Amitabh Bachchan line from his, uh, uh, iconic line from his movies. So, language is something that's fluid. It's not written in stone. And unless la language evolves, this uh, really becomes a static dead language, like Latin. So, I like the idea of... Uh, breaking the rules generally in life, but certainly with language. OK, the gossip column may be dead or may not be dead, but your columns are very much alive and clicking uh, and kicking. And you are a very prolific, witty blogger with an opinion on everything. And you have been writing this column called Politically Incorrect for the last, I think, 40 plus years. Yes. So in a way, uh, Shobha, you are a chronicler of our times. Uh, and I would like to ask you, how has the country changed in the last 40 years? And for better or for worse? Goodness, I mean, that uh, deserves a book or at least five sessions to be able to deconstruct the change of over 40 years. But I'm an optimist. And I feel extremely proud of being an Indian. I felt proud being an Indian 40 years ago. I continue to feel proud of being an Indian. But like any huge country, any democracy, with our diversities and our contradictions, we have gone through turbulent times. We went through turbulent times from the time we've 
uh, got our independence with some ridiculous line that was drawn. So the Radcliffe line arbitrarily drawn by someone who didn't know. And the, the kind of pain and trauma of partition, uh, is still it still lingers. So it's not something I can answer very easily. All I can say is that uh, the environment today is something that may have existed and in exactly the same form, maybe even a more, uh, maybe a harsher version of it, but there was no social media then to chronicle it and comment on it the way we are doing today. And I know I've had my share of trouble, including police protection for years because of being outspoken and out there. But yes, the, uh, the, like uh, we were talking earlier, there's no such thing as uh, press freedom, really. It's the freedom of reach, as Namita put it so wonderfully. Uh, uh, it's not freedom of speech, it's freedom of reach. And today, to put yourself out there comes with its own hazards. But I will continue to say what I want to say, and I'm uh, in a way very grateful to my editors because they don't censor me or nudge me to say this or not say that because I'll just stop those columns if I was in any way curtailed from expressing myself. So I'm really grateful to the people who support me and the readers, of course, because without readers, there is no writer, whether it's books or columns or if you're blogging, Twitter, you need the oxygen of what the readers give you and a validation which all of us seek in, in, our, in our different ways and in our fields. You wrote a book called Superstar India, yeah. in which you talked about the many achievements of India and the challenges that India still faces. What, according to you, is the number one challenge that our country faces currently? It would be education. The minute we educate our people and uh, give the girl child in particular and the Muslim girl child even more specifically, a chance at bettering their lives. It'll be a completely different nation. So uh, forget the usual arguments about hate and divisiveness and how it's growing, of course. Uh, these are the obvious, uh, way it's all there for anyone who cares to understand how uh, profound that is in itself. But when you educate uh, your women, it's going to be a totally different ball game. And I can give you personal examples because that's always the best place to understand something as vast as a phenomenon which is taking place, but taking place quietly and maybe not at the pace we want it to. That the, uh, the ladies who work in our home, um, including the two Muslim ladies who work uh, in our home, their entire, a, a large chunk of their salary goes towards educating their daughters and against odds, like a tremendous odds. And those ladies would rather give up on the little comforts that their salaries can get them. But they are so clear and so specific. We want our girls to be educated. We want them to have a better life. And I think that is of the number one priority facing India. The rest, I'm sure uh, Narendra Modi has all the answers for. Who am I to contribute <laughs> my two bits? The Supreme Court has very recently put all sedition cases on hold while the government decides whether to repeal this colonial era law. Tell us about the time when you were held guilty of sedition and were about to go to jail. Well, that was really, I mean, I'll never forget that period. Who can? I was expecting my daughter who was sitting here at the time uh, when uh, the case was, uh, it was uh, Simranjit Singh Man, an IPS officer, an outstanding IPS officer, I understand. Uh, who had, who was accused of having somehow helped Bidrin Wale and the Khalistani, um, the movement with uh, arms, ammunition, and many other support systems as a police officer at that time. It was an SP, I think, in the Punjab. And so the last, or rather the only interview he gave to a journalist in the English language happened to be to me, and it was an interview conducted at Samovar one late evening. He was very articulate, and he's, he, he, it was a brilliant mind. It was a great interview. So after the interview was published, and he went underground the next morning. Now, I was not to know that you know the whole assassination of Indira Gandhi would then be tied up to that one interview, because the only thing where he was incriminating himself was that one interview. So I ended up being accused number three in a sedition and treason charge. 
And that wasn't fun at all because, you know, here I was visibly pregnant, waddling up to the court. Uh, Mr. Day would bring back lunch and we'd be sitting there with Simranjit Singh Maan's wife sitting close by. She'd attend the sessions. And there'd be hardcore criminals, murderers, pickpockets sitting around us, which was okay because they were less harm harmful than what was anticipated by my lawyers who kept saying, Madam, please don't wish Mrs. Mann or don't sit next to her because we don't know. There can be a terrorist attack in the court and they'll be targeting her. There could be a shootout. If you're next to her, you'll be in the crossfire. So make sure you sit at the other end of the court. So it was kind of challenging. It was very uh, surrealistic. I was also very amused by the whole procedure. I could find humor in it. And uh, then the date was fixed for the trial to begin in Bhagalpur. Imagine, where the blindings yes. case and all of it. And the date was fixed for that. And Mr. Day was booking our railway tickets because that was the only way to go to Bhagalpur. And I was wondering whether Anandita would be born in Bhagalpur <laughs> jail because I was almost <laughs> full term at the time. And the judge looking at my belly said, and I, you know, the lawyer is pleading, sir, on compassionate grounds, madam, you know, madam is, he said, she should have thought of all this before she <laughs> interviewed the man. We are not concerned whether she's pregnant, not pregnant. I mean, off she goes, the trial starts. So, but the government fell, which was really a timely intervention. And uh, I think God was on Anandita's side rather than mine. Imagine, you know, giving birth to, you did pop out in three minutes and almost in the car, just by the way. <laughs> So it was, it was one of those uh, amazing incidents which is memorable in the context of what's happening now and the sedition law being on hold. It, it should just be scrapped as uh, Kapil Sibyl thundered, scrap the law, scrap the law. Well, if they have any brains, they will because uh, certainly the, uh, there are many laws right now which are uh, beyond despotic, which need to be questioned and which need to be addressed and citizens are too terrified to voice their uh, reservations. And that's one of the things that you know the present administration needs to be far, far more sensitive to. If you're calling ourselves a democracy, then freedom of expression, freedom of speech, we already know freedom of reach is there. Your column is titled Politically Incorrect. Was that a deliberate choice? Do you like to be politically incorrect? I don't, uh, I, it's not a construct. I like the way it sounded, and I've never been a conformist. I've always sort of broken the mold, so it seemed very apt. And the editor thought that was Fatima Zakaria many years ago when Kushwan Singh and mm. she worked very closely together. She was the editor of Sunday Times, and she liked the sound of it herself. And it sort of worked for me, and it continues to work for me because it pretty much sums up my attitude towards uh, being a commentator in the public domain, I cannot be politically correct, don't wish to be politically correct, so I think it just works great. And it got into trouble pretty soon, pretty early on, isn't it? When I don't you wrote remember. Something, I'm proud to be a ghati. <laughs> yes. I don't remember any <laughs> point in my writing career where I have not been in some kind of trouble or the other. Uh, so I, it's like part of the. It goes with the territory. And like I often say to people, if you don't, the whole cliche, if you don't like the heat, stay out of the kitchen. But yes, I wrote a column saying the ghati in me, the ghati, ghati in me. Right. And the Shiv Sena, they're forever objecting to everything I say because they think I should be one of them, being a Maharashtrian. I should stand in solidarity with them. And that's nonsense because I won't stand in solidarity with anyone. I mean, I'm not a groupie of any political party. I'm, 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 I'm an independent person. So they brought a morcha to the house and raised slogans and said uh, she's letting the Maharashtrians down. And of course, at that time, Bala Sahib Thakre was alive and he had uh, such an absolute grip over uh, the city of Mumbai, Maharashtra. And one word from anybody and you know the goons would be at your door and uh, ready to lynch, kill, anything. Because Dadagiri was what defined the party and it still does. So, yeah, so I, I, I was a bit surprised. I said, listen, I'm calling myself a ghati because I'm from the ghats and I'm Maharashtrian and I'm saying I'm proud to be that. So what's your problem? I know what the problem is. They don't read English. So someone must have told them from within the party, look what she's written. She's calling us names. She is calling Bala Sahib names because he's going to be now defied very soon, as you know. They're going to call Shiv Sena Bhavana Mandir or some such thing. 
So she's insulting us, the Maharashtrian pride. Second time, uh, quite more recently, when I made a joke about pav bhaji, which is a popular snack in Mumbai, for heaven's sake. And again, the Shiv Sena sent a mocha to our home and said that she's insulting Maharashtrian snacks. She's comparing it to popcorn. She's saying that, you know, this is, uh, uh, it's an insult to Maharashtrian culture that she can insult our popular snack. So this is the kind of bigoted, narrow-mindedness we deal with. But uh, really, my, my, my attitude has always been to bullies, bring it on, and I will, I will handle it. So when the cops came to my house to say there are all these, uh, you know, the Shiv Seneks and uh, Raj Thakri's goons, uh, yelling slogans, you know, they pay these guys to come there. There were women there saying, Shobha day, murda ba, shobha day, hi, hi. They come with the black, blackening agents, whatever they put on people's faces to humiliate them. And they got a huge tokri with vada pao. It said Shiv Sena vada pao, which they said, uh, uh, we want to gag her with it. In Marathi, it sounds even worse. Uh, whatever they said, horrible. So the police guy said, please don't even go to the balcony because they're likely to throw stones. Mm. And I said, the hell I'm going to hide. I said, let's go down and meet them. The police were nervous. They said, madam, you, you, you want to go and meet these people? I said, yes. So I went to the gate. And there were all these people yelling. I don't even think half of them knew I was Shoba. <laughs> they were just paid. <laughs> because they didn't expect to me to come there, right? right. So I said, do you want to say something to me? So they said, no, no, madam, I mean, I want to say something uh, we have come to give you vada pao. <laughs> so I took that tokri of vada pao, and I took a picture of it, and I tweeted it saying, delicious, thank you very much, Shiv Sena. I mean, that was it. So they said, Acha. Uh, so I said, do you mind if I distribute it to the police and to everybody else? Because I won't be able to eat so many vada pao's. <laughs> that was the end of it. You know, what could they do? So the cops, just for the heck of it, threw a few of them into the van and said, chalo, chalo, police station, chalo, chalo. And that's how it ended, but it can go completely out of control, as you know, how these things go. So, but, well, that was my latest encounter. I can't guarantee there won't be more in future, because they're forever examining everything I write, and the uh, translators of English tweets into Marathi get it hopelessly wrong, constantly, <laughs> but that's part of the hazard. Your other column is called, is based on gender issues, where you talk about, you know, uh, women, women's issues, etc. And all your books have very strong female protagonists who are not, who don't see themselves as doormats, who eventually come around and take charge of their lives. Yeah. So what was your take on this whole Me Too movement? Again, it's a, it's a very complex, it's, a, it's an issue we're still dealing with. We haven't really come out of it in a way that is significantly better for women at all. Um, in India, particularly, it's been hopeless uh, because most of the Me Too charges have been dropped and forgotten and most of the high profile Me Too people uh, have continued to, with, an, with the exception of uh, Tarun Tejpal, uh, who's still fighting his case, but most of the others have gotten away very lightly and they're uh, back in the mainstream carrying on with their lives like nothing ever happened and uh, no charge has gone all the way through and uh, women continue to be um, I hate to use the word victimized, but certainly at the receiving end of um, a kind of attention that qualifies as Me Too anywhere in the world. And a lot of people in the film industry have gotten away with it. They're uh, back doing what they've always done, uh, which is taking advantage of young uh, hopefuls who come from small towns in India, promising them jobs. Uh, it's uh, based on deception and uh, um, just tempting them with uh, fame and money. So the Me Too movement across the world was politically better organized, and a few heads did roll. In India, the position of women itself is not taken seriously enough. Uh, they are trivialized and they are objectified in a way that makes it all okay. It's kind of sanctioned by society at large. So I'm not blaming the government per se, though there's a lot to blame them for on many other fronts. This is something that is a societal issue much more. And uh, unless we get around to addressing that, um, not much change is, uh, is going to happen because uh, the, the thinking continues to be what it was before Me Too ever mm. got on to India and uh, all of it. So uh, 
a still a very tricky terrain, and we haven't really come out smelling of roses at all. I want to ask you about social media now. Uh, is social media a threat to democracy, or is it really a boon to democracy? How do you deal with trolling on Twitter, for instance? I deal with it the best way that I know how, by ignoring trolls completely, because I don't deal with cowards and I don't deal with anonymity. And I like what Disraeli advised his queen, uh, never complain and never uh, explain. So I say what I say and I take what comes with it. And if it involves a, a, a court case, well, I'll fight it because I stand by what I've uh, said. So if it's uncomfortable for a few people, but that, that is the nature of the beast. If you do not like that beast, don't uh, you know, go to bed with the beast, stay away. But having gotten into the, into, you cannot not be on social media if you're in a, me, a creature of media. You have to learn to live with it, but there's no question that you can actually tame the beast because you can't. And in a democracy uh, where each one can be, if they want to be, uh, each one can be a journalist. I mean, opinion goes like this, and often it uh, comes without any strings attached, no sense of responsibility, but that is also the strength of a democracy that we still have that and we are not yet China. So uh, you know that is a huge big thing we should be proud of. And even if they try to control it, they won't be able to. So if the government has learned to live with it, they can bring on their armies, they can harrow people, they can use their army to fight citizens. But eventually, the citizen will win, because we are still a democracy, and I have a lot of faith in the voice of the av average Indian citizen may not be politically aware, but certainly knows right from wrong, and will speak up, and must speak up. OK, now let's, I want to probe Shobha Day, the person now. Uh, right now, what was I? Yeah, right now, you were the author, you know, you were the blogger, you were the opinion maker, etc. Oh. But now, Shobha Day, the person. So tell me, what was the COVID life for you? What lessons did you learn from the pandemic? I could give a politically correct answer, uh, and I could give an honest one. I prefer the honest. Uh, the COVID life was initially the first uh, few months. It was a tremendous struggle in terms of uh, the mental breakdown that took place for most of us. It was uh, something that was unprecedented. It was so cataclysmic that we couldn't understand that a microbe can hold the whole world to ransom. It took a lot of time to come to terms with that. Then came the personal. I mean, you're suddenly stuck at home, and uh, there are three of us in the house, her, uh, Mr. Day, and myself, and uh, he couldn't go to work, and she couldn't go out. And we were, it, a lot of people felt trapped. It led to a lot of hostility. It led to a great deal of uh, struggle in communication because you know you suddenly started to ask yourself my god what what if is this what it's all about because we were in each other's hair we were uh, it, the, it was not pleasant at all till we found that there were spaces in the house which we could occupy and leave each other alone and uh, some sort of truce uh, happened in a few months but the first few months were very hard and for me honestly speaking professionally it was one of the most productive periods of my life. And I've always worked from my dining table, so it wasn't that I missed going to an office or I missed, yes, I missed interaction, because for a writer, that is really everything. Then you meet people, the energy you get from that. But I've always written from my dining table. I continue to write from my dining table. I finished a, a book during the pandemic, written during the pandemic, published as an e-book, then as a physical book called Lockdown Liaisons a uh, set of 26 stories. So for me, every week of putting those stories, four stories out every week, was not just a challenge. It was like something that, that drove me. I wrote at a manic pace. It was therapeutic. And I also finished a novel at the time which I was uh, writing, and ahead of schedule, which was Sri Laji. And the novel just got sexier and sexier because I, I guess uh, my mood, I, I was looking for some, some sort of distraction. Or, and her character, of course, was perfect for, for whatever her sexual adventures turned out to be in the novel. Uh, so uh, work-wise, no complaints at all. But on a much bigger, much, much bigger level and scale, uh, there was a great deal of introspection. 
uh, not just about yourself. It wasn't me, me, I, me, myself. No, you looked at uh, on a much larger uh, kind of um, your 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 mind expanded in ways to embrace the bad and the positives. And I think the positives of uh, though definitely we learned to live with ourselves in a better way to curate our lives uh, in a way that was significant, I'm sure, for all of us. Uh, I know that I cut the flab, and a lot of relationships that one had invested in, which had no value, no meaning anymore, you just moved away from negativity of any kind, and you focused on each day that you woke up was a second chance. It was, you were breathing, you were alive, and there was so much, I lost so many friends uh, during the pandemic, and just the thought that, my God, look at the loss that other people are going, what they're enduring, and you felt a deep sense of gratitude, and that gratitude, I think, is carried forward, even though we are coming out of the pandemic, and also the awareness for the younger generation to be far more responsible uh, as far as the environment is concerned, and climate change, as we can see it in the Maldives right now, the rains which are unseasonal are here. The Mumbai monsoon is much earlier this year as well, and uh, so much damage that the world was not thinking deeply enough about. Uh, which we're all responsible for. I think that was a significant shift in in people's minds and hearts, and I hope it's a permanent shift because if we are going to be, if this planet is to survive, that is the biggest challenge that we need to address and do something about. Oh, thanks, Farzana. Oh, yes, another therapeutic. Thank you. So, uh, Anandita, uh, I had to, uh, you know, I wouldn't. Shall I say bribe? No, no, not bribe. Okay, you. I did bribe you, right? Anyway, I had to, I, I, I 50 videos, one a day, which was a quick, short comment on the pandemic, but beyond the pandemic, uh, was shot, uh, you know, straight, 50 videos in 50 days, which she would very sweetly shoot for me. Sometimes she'd be very grumpy because it was always at a time when she wanted to take a nap or something. I'd beg of her, I'd say, please, Anna, you got to do it. It's only two minutes of your time. It's not just about those two minutes, mom. I mean, come on. But anyway. Yeah, it was terrible. So anyway, she, she wasn't always in the mood to shoot those videos, but we did it. And I was happy to make a total idiot of myself. I can't carry a note, really. Hindi music, I don't even know that oh, music, but I'd find a song from Bollywood films going back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, whenever, which captured the mood of that particular video. And I would sing it, croak it, uh, without any, you know, my, my pronunciation all rubbish, out of tune, but you know, people started to respond to those songs and started to suggest songs. That what next next week, next tomorrow, why don't you sing this or why don't you sing that? That's and amazing. it was so sweet because it was a kind of bonding. I mean, uh, film music is bonding, and uh, I didn't care that there were times when I was having the worst hair day, and I said, just look at my hair today. Can you see the gray in it? Because you know, the salons were closed and all of it. And a lot of people identified with the truth. At the end of it all, it has to be about authenticity. Yes. Anything that you do in life, without authenticity, and especially now, social media, the scrutiny is so strong and so penetrating. Uh, you, you, you can see a fake, you can spot a fake, you can hear a fake, it doesn't work. Okay, final question. <laughs> what, darling? We are, we are, yeah. We are living in an age now, Shobha, we are living in an age where now biopics are being made on living personalities. We had films. I think the last question, last let's, question. Yeah, so then I'll then. open it up. So I said we are living in an age where now biopics are being made on living personalities. We had films on Dhoni, on Kapil Dev, on Mary Com, on Gunjan Saxena. So not if, but when a film is made on you, who would like, who would you like to play yourself? Only Kangana Ranaut. <laughs> And Mr. Oh, Day, yeah. and Mr. Day. Uh, it would have been Uttam Kumar, yeah. but he isn't there anymore. <laughs> but uh, so uh, we'll, uh, I don't find anyone as uh, suitable or as uh, uh, with as stronger personality. So uh, not the current lot. So maybe a new new star altogether okay. will be born. But I don't like the idea of biopics. I don't like the. Uh, it's a vanity project, and uh, I'm still living my life, and I don't really care. And I have a lot of offers, most of them clumsy and um, 
not impressive so at your all. So worst nightmare will be an unauthorized biopic then. Which, if it happens, let it happen. I believe <laughs> Ravina Tandon did play me in some movie or the other, her version of me. And then she was sending me messages saying, I hope you like my representation. I said, which movie, honey? I haven't even watched it. <laughs> Okay, no, on that no, no, note. No, 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 no. Bio Ladies pick. and gentlemen, Shobha Day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and now you. we have a few minutes yeah, for questions from the audience. Any questions? I mean, you know, we have a few minutes if anyone would like to ask of Shobha or Vikas. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. We talk about women's empowerment till literally the cows come home right now. We've talked about the Me Too movement, dismantling patriarchy, etc., etc. But would you say that. Um, the woman of today is stronger than the woman of yesterday, perhaps? Or is she more fragile? Because with so, I mean, I don't know, what's your take no, no, on see, that? Strong is a, is a word that's open to interpretation. I would say my grandmother, who was hardly educated, was an exceptionally strong lady in terms of her circumstances. My mother was an exceptionally strong person, but not overtly strong. And uh, she was very much her own woman and held her own regardless. My father was a bureaucrat, and my mother would often accompany him to various very grand functions. And she possessed two good saris, and then the home saris. But nothing daunted her. I mean, whether she was being introduced to the governor of some state, or an ambassador visiting, uh, you know, head of state, president, prime minister, she was a confident lady in her own skin. And uh, very proud of her sari, very proud that my father, and you know, for example, uh, she would be taunted by her sisters to say, oh, but your father has, uh, I mean, your husband has not been able to give you diamond kuris or diamond mangal sutra, which for a Maharashtra lady is it. If your husband hasn't given you a diamond mangal sutra and diamond kuris, I mean, what kind of a husband is he? And I used to love the way she would respond, especially to one sister who's, who was married to a corrupt police officer who was uh, suspended. And she told her archly, tartly, but softly. She said, you know, the problem is my husband is a very honest man. Wow. So he, he can't, he, so it's, it's OK if I don't have a, a diamond kudis and all that. Looking pointedly at her sister's diamond kudis. So um, strong is a relative term. Uh, fragile, I agree, because the pressure to be a certain kind of woman today is, uh, uh, is, is a lot. To come into your own today, the scrutiny is that much more. And, uh, but I would say the average person, the av I'm not talking about people in media or people who are uh, in the public domain and on any front, the opportunities are that much, I mean, they're just brilliant, the opportunities today to achieve your dreams for a woman. If she works hard enough, uh, there is no stopping her. And uh, I think the women of our country have always been exceptional, continue to, um, to inspire and, uh, uh, Really, the sky is the limit. So fragile, yes, but that makes them that much more appealing and vulnerable because to be kind of a superwoman with no fragility, no vulnerability, to say you know nothing and no one can touch my inner self and all of it, which is A, rubbish, because all of us are fragile, men and women. And we often forget that men are equally fragile. And the pressure on them is as strong as it is on a woman today because that's, that's life today. And, I think the younger generation, they've managed to get their equations, emotional equations, emotional quotient. Uh, it's better tuned than certainly my generation because for me, there was too much stereotyping. I mean, I have no problem dealing with it, but it was a nuisance. Even today, I mean, I'm going to be 75 for Christ's sake in a, a few months. And after every session, what I'm asked is, but madam, how do you preserve yourself? So that stereotyping of women, it's very driven by your physicality. Can, so I used to answer, uh, how do I preserve myself? In vinegar, of course. <laughs> but that started to backfire, so I stopped saying it. But uh, yeah, that scrutiny, I don't think a lot of um, men would have to endure. Uh, but I think with a laugh and a sense of humor, you can deal with any situation in life, honestly. Last question. Anyone? OK, then let me ask the last question. Oscar Wilde said, with age comes wisdom. So at the age of 74, have you figured out the meaning of life? Are you joking? Wisdom? <laughs> I'm looking, searching most of the time. I'm like a lost schoolgirl, looking for answers. And I hope I never find them, because that's the end. What is wisdom? 
you know, what is wisdom? That's the end of the road when you think I'm so evolved, I have all the answers. Oh no, I hope I never become a wise woman, never. I hope I remain reckless. I hope I remain irresponsible on many fronts, apart from my responsibility to my family. I hope I remain adventurous, curious, um, uh, a vagabond, and never, no, wisdom doesn't even appeal to me. I don't even like wise people. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Shobha Day.